LVGL is an amazing library for building beautiful, responsive interfaces on all kinds of devices. But it also comes with a mountain of configuration options that can feel overwhelming. This video is your shortcut. I will use LVGL version 9 and I will walk you through the settings step by step, explaining which ones matter most and how to set them up for your ESP32 projects. First, let's find the configuration file. In the LVGL library folder, you'll see this template that the LVGL team provides, and it's the one you need to tweak for every new project. To use it, you'll need to rename it to lv underscore conf.h and copy it alongside your other libraries and put a 1 on this line to enable the LVGL configuration. That setup can be a bit inconvenient because the same file will be shared across all your projects. And with so many ESP32 boards and display types, you'll often need to customize it differently each time. That's why at the end of this video, I will also show you a simple way to include a dedicated LVGL configuration file for each project so you can safely tweak settings without affecting your other projects. All right, let's begin with the very first thing that will help you, logging. One of the easiest things to forget is logging, but trust me, it's the very first setting you should enable. Without it, you'll have no idea what LVGL is doing when something doesn't work. So turn logging by replacing zero with a one. With it, you can see errors, warnings, and even debug info right in the serial monitor. For most beginners, the warn level is a good default. You'll see warnings and errors. And make sure this one is also set, so logs go straight to your serial output. Here is how to use logging in the LVGL9 project. You create a small function that takes the log messages from LVGL and prints them to the serial monitor. Then, inside the setup, we just tell LVGL to call this function whenever it has something to report. That way, every warning or error shows up right on the serial monitor, making it much easier to troubleshoot. LVGL can run on many operating systems, even on Windows. On the ESP32, you're running FreeRTOS, and you set it here. I also recommend enabling this setting. It uses direct task notifications instead, which improves speed. If you try to run multiple LVGL tasks in parallel and you enable this option, things may break. Next, let's pick the right color format. This must match your display or driver. Most ESP32 displays use RGB565, so set this setting to 16. On some 60-bit color displays, the colors might look swapped, like red showing as blue. In that case, you just add one more line, with a 1 to enable it. That tells LVGL to flip the byte order so the colors show correctly. Here is a WaveShare AMOLED display that needs this swap. Here is how the colors look without the swap. And here is the better version with the swap color enabled. LVGL needs memory for its widgets, styles, and images. For most beginners, the default setting works fine. But if you're using larger images or building an interface with lots of widgets, you'll need to increase it. The good news is that if your ESP32 development board has built-in PSRAM, LVGL will automatically take advantage of it. No extra configuration required. When you increase this value, do it gradually. Start around 120 kilobytes, and if you're still missing images or crashes, step up to 256 kilobytes. Fonts in LVGL can be a little tricky if you don't know how they work. By default, only one font is enabled in the template, Montserrat 14, and it's also set as the default font. That's why when you drop a label on the screen, you'll usually see text right away. But if you want a different size, you'll need to enable it manually in the config. Every font size you turn on takes up flash memory, so only activate the ones you really need. It's also a good idea to set your own default font. That way, all your labels and widgets will automatically use it, 
and you won't have to set the font for every single object. Another setting that's easy to overlook is this one. LVGL relies on floating point internally for certain widgets. For example, ones that display numbers or that needs interpolation for smooth animations. If this setting is turned off, those widgets may not behave correctly. Labels can go blank or values won't update when we expect decimals. If this settings in this example is not enabled, those angle readings disappeared completely. Enabling it fixed the issue right away. You don't need to start from scratch when styling your interface. LVGL has a built-in default theme. It gives your app a consistent look right away. And you can even switch it to dark mode if that fits your project better. On top of that, LVGL includes two very useful layout engines, Flex and Grid. Keep them enabled. They let you arrange objects without manually calculating pixels' positions. LVGL draws using a software renderer by default. Keep it enabled. And this one, when it's on, you get rounded corners, shadows, gradients, opacity, and other visual effects. Turning it off use less flash memory, but you lose those effects. Even if your display is RGB 565, the renderer sometimes needs other color formats internally. Gradients are done in RGB 888, and images with transparency can use ARGB 8888. If you disable those formats to save space, certain effects or images may render wrong or not at all. If you want save defaults, keep all of the common color formats enabled. If you absolutely need to save flash space, start by disabling the less common alpha only formats one by one and test your project carefully. But don't disable these two if you use gradients, shadows or transparent images. LVGL comes with a lot of widgets, buttons, labels, sliders, charts, calendars and more. Each widget you enable takes up some flash space, so in a final project you can disable the ones you don't use to slim down your build. During prototyping though, it's best to keep them all enabled. That way you can experiment freely without wondering if something is missing because the widget was turned off. Display configuration is a big topic on its own and I cover it in detail in a dedicated video. Let's quickly look at few other settings. These are usually less important and unless you're doing something very specific, the defaults are perfectly fine for the SP32. This is the master tick period LVGL uses for animations, input handling, and screen refresh. A lower value makes everything smoother, but it also uses more CPU. Enable this if you need advanced rotation or scaling beyond the basic pivot and zoom. It adds extra CPU cost because there's more math and more buffering involved. You also need to enable this one. Be aware that if it's misconfigured, some users have reported crashes when mixing it with rotation. This defines the buffer used when widgets need blending, like semi-transparent objects or special blend modes. If the buffer is too small, performance can drop because LVGL has to process in chunks, and in rare cases you may hit memory errors. On the ESP32 you might tune this down to save RAM, but in most cases, the default is fine. If you use a dedicated drawing thread, this sets the stack size. On the ESP32 with free RTOS, stack memory is limited. Too little stack leads to overflow. Too much is just wasted. The default value usually works. This is the cache for images. It can speed up performance because images don't have to be decoded repeatedly. But it takes RAM. On the ESP32, it's always a balance between caching and memory usage. This controls buffer alignment. It matters if your display driver or DMA requires aligned memory, like 4-byte alignment. Misalignment can cause inefficiencies or even hardware faults. For most displays, the default is fine. If you want to load assets like PNGs, GIF, or LUTI animations from a file system, like a SD card, SPIF, FATFS, or LittleFS, you need to enable file system support and register your drivers. You'll also have to enable the specific asset type you want to load. This enables vector drawing of shapes and SVGs directly in LVGL. 
To use it, you'll also need a renderer. LVGL includes an internal one called TorVG, which you can activate with this setting. By default, LVGL looks for its configuration file in the root of the library's folder. And that single file gets shared across all your projects. That's not ideal if you're working with different TSP32 boards or displays, since each project may need its own tweaks. If you put this define in your sketch, before the LVGL include, LVGL will instead look for the configuration file in your sketch folder. That means you can just drop the configuration file next to your code, and LVGL will pick it up automatically. The benefit is that each project can have its own LVGL configuration file without interfering with the global one or with other projects. Any tweaks you make in the LVGL config file inside your project will apply only to that project. LVGLs give you a huge amount of control and once you know which settings matter, it becomes a lot more fun to work with. Tweak them to fit your ESP32 project and you'll see your interfaces come alive. If this video helped you, make sure to like, subscribe and share it with other makers. Thanks for watching guys.